Good evening. You're watching the Digital Age, and I'm James Goodale. Al Jazeera's got a new service called Al Jazeera English. You haven't seen it because no cable operator will run it. But well, we're going to show it to you tonight, and you are going to be surprised what you see. It looks more like BBC than BBC looks like itself. So what is Al Jazeera up to? What is its strategy? What is the real strategy of Al Jazeera? And tonight, we have Dave Marish joining us from Washington, where he is the Washington anchor, U.S. anchor, in fact, of Al Jazeera News, English. And Dave, I want to welcome you to the show. Jim, thanks very much. And actually, it's greater than that. I'm the hemispheric anchor because the, hemispheric the, way, <laughs> the way that our system works, each of our four broadcast bases has regional responsibilities. And Washington is responsible not just for Washington or the United States or North America, but the whole Western Hemisphere. My and, of God. course, the orientation of the channel, which is south first, means that we give very heavy coverage to Latin America. It's well, an we, interesting we, place to be. We want to show... Uh, the audience what this is really like. But before we do that, we want to remind the audience of what Al Jazeera Arabic, if I can call it, is like. And what we're going to do is we're going to show uh, an interview that took place on Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera Arabic. And it's introduced by a gentleman whose name is Mr. Fokara. Abdurrahim. And he is a uh, correspondent uh, for Al Jazeera. So let's take a look. To expect the host, uh, a, any particular host on Al Jazeera or any other set or any other channel, to behave the same way that a host on an American channel behaves, I don't think that's necessary. now that uh, what you just saw there, Dave, is uh, an interview. It, there's, it's a host. I mean, it's like you. And his name is Dr. Faisal Qasim. And uh, I, I take it you would agree that when you're on Al Jazeera, you can't act like an American host? Well, I disagree. I, you act like yourself, and of course, I am an American, and so I would be an American host. Um, you know, uh, Kasim's program is in some ways the epitome of Al Jazeera in Arabic. It's called the opposite view. And the motto of Al Jazeera Arabic has always been the opinion and its opposite. And when this channel started broadcasting 10 years this, ago, Al Jazeera, Arabic. Al Jazeera in Arabic, right. it entered a landscape in which the whole orientation towards information was traditional and authoritarian. Um, you didn't consult empirical reporting. Uh, you consulted religious texts and the Haditha tradition. Or you went to the imam and consulted with him. Or in matters political, you went to the state and got their permission to say this or that. And Al Jazeera has blown all that up and brought in the opinion and its opposite, and even more than that, an existential imperative. The, exist the opinion and its opposite, and you decide. Well, let's see what you look like on the English version of Al Jazeera. Old and gray. <laughs> Moshe Katsav says he will suspend his duty so he can clear his name. I'm Rida Fakhri, and you're watching Al Jazeera from Washington. I'm Dave Marish. Also coming up on the program, U.S. President George Bush does a real hard sell on his State of the Union agenda. As his press secretary Tony Snow tells Al Jazeera that a U.S. defeat in Iraq is unacceptable. 
Israel's prime minister has called for the country's president to resign. Moshe Katsav is facing allegations of rape and abuse of power, but he says he'll only give up his job when and if he's formally charged. In an impassioned appeal, the president calls the accusations against him, quote, a vicious and terrible and unprecedented attack. Al Jazeera's John Terrett has more. Israel's president addressing his people. Moshe Katsov told Israelis he intends to take leave of absence to fight charges of rape and abuse of power. I will fight even if a world war is necessary. In Israel, the president enjoys immunity when in office and can be tried only after he resigns, is impeached or comes to the end of his term. The job is mainly ceremonial, greeting foreign dignitaries and representing the country as a state. Past incumbents have been revered statesmen like the war hero turned peacemaker Asa Weizmann, who resigned in 2000, accused of improperly accepting gifts from a French millionaire. That year, the Knesset chose Mr. Katzoff, a Likud cabinet minister, for the top job over the Nobel Peace Prize winner Shimon Peres. The scandal at the palace is mirrored by problems of a different kind in the government itself. Prime Minister Ehud Olmert is facing a criminal investigation for allegedly trying to rig the sale of a major bank two years ago when he was finance minister, and an inquiry into his alleged mishandling of last summer's inconclusive war in Lebanon with Hezbollah. The Prime Minister's approval rating is down to 14%, leaving many to wonder if his time in office is also about to be cut short. Well, ladies and gentlemen, and David, that is the first time an American audience is seen AGE, Al Jazeera English, on over the air television and cable television in the United States because the cable operators won't run it. With three exceptions. Three Jim. exceptions. Three exceptions. Oh, someone else is We are on three cable systems. Oh, you are? The Pentagon's in house oh. system, <laughs> right. the State Department's right. in house okay. system, and Think Mayor Bernie Sanders, before he was a congressman, before he was a senator, yeah. when he was mayor of Burlington, Vermont. Right. Burlington, Vermont's cable system is municipally operated, and they put us on. It's one. the one cable system one. in America okay, well, beyond the Pentagon. But, we, the but you are on the Internet. We are very much so on the Internet. Al if I may, www.aljazeera.net forward slash English and you will then come to a home page which has on it the words watch us sort of like Alice in Wonderland you hit that uh, and you will be given your choice of 15 minutes free endlessly renewable 15 minutes at 56 K which is rather herky-jerky or oh, you can subscribe K. and get uh, broadband where the video quality is virtually that of real television okay now I've been watching it uh, for for a couple of weeks on, on the net, and I think it's very interesting. What strikes me about it is that, unlike the first bit we showed, showed from Al Jazeera, which may be on the edge of what Al Jazeera does, but it's what we think Al Jazeera does, it seemed like BBC. I mean, the, the, the correspondents uh, had a British accent. What is the BBC connection here? Well, of course, the original Al Jazeera in Arabic sprang from uh, BBC's Arabic service, which died when the co-sponsor of the Saudi royal family pulled the plug on it. And the Emir of Qatar saw that there was this cadre of, Engl of, of uh, English-trained Arabic-speaking journalists who were meant to put on a region-wide satellite news channel. And he said, this is a great idea. Why don't we do it? And uh, thus started Al Jazeera Arabic. Now, I have to say that Al Jazeera Arabic, as do we, have essentially two kinds of programming, news and what we call programming, which is magazines, documentaries, and talk shows, and the very vigorous discussion that you saw on uh, Kasim's opposite view was from the programming side. My guess is that the first little clip where you saw Abdurrahim Fukara saying, uh, we're not just like American hosts, that might have been from the news side. But I think when you see things on the news side, they are are going to look very much like the BBC or in production values at least like Fox News or CNN or MSNBC. Well, do you have a, a BBC person in charge of uh, Al Jazeera president? Actually, our news director, Steve Clark, is from ITN, which is uh, one of the commercial channels in the UK, uh, and for years has been a very substantial journalistic competitor to the BBC. But the old BBC tradition 
of very high quality, very intellectually ambitious news is definitely the tradition that we're in. And in fact, we, as, as you hinted at the start, uh, today's BBC world is very much a deluded version of that original market, uh, of that original uh, programming. It's gone somewhat down market to take on CNN, and we are going to try and shoot a little bit higher. Uh, and what that really means is we're going to do fewer stories every half hour at greater length, which allows us to give you more depth, nuance, and detail. Well, I think that what we saw was at a pretty, pretty high level. Now, uh, how many people, you got a bureau down there? And how many people, we have, have you got the whole hemisphere, how many reporters do you have? Well, in Washington, we have a staff, obviously not all reporters, but a staff, including technical staff, that now is more than 120. Uh, we also have a bureau in New York. We also have a bureau in Caracas, a bureau in Buenos Aires, a bureau that's just being built in Sao Paulo, and we have stringers uh, all over Latin America um, and uh, in Los Angeles. So uh, how much money is the Emir uh, throwing into this? Uh, I have seen estimates as high as a billion dollars. A billion dollars? Uh, it's very have expensive. You, have, have you been to Qatar? I have been to Qatar. And uh, what happened when you got there? Uh, I was basically introduced around to uh, almost all of the news staff and the news executives. Um, I saw their facilities, which are quite literally state of the art. Um, it's a fantastic soundstage. Uh, it's a tremendous satellite um, output and input setup. It is state of the art global television. Well, what do you figure that the uh, Amir of Qatar? is up to. Uh, first of all, who is he? Well, the Emir of Qatar um, is the ruler of um, a little thumb-sized peninsula extending into the Persian Gulf. Qatar, uh, total population well under a million, and that includes a lot of guest workers. Um, and it sits atop the second or third largest collection of natural gas in the world. And I think what the Emir is up to with Al Jazeera, uh, the Al Jazeera networks, and with his other main investment, which I'll get to in a minute, is basically setting up revenue streams for the future when the natural gas supplies start to run well, down. Can I just That's stop? 20 can to I, 30 years in can, the future. Can I just stop you on that? Because uh, if you go through the, through the literature on all this, most people would say the Amir, what the Emir is up to is doing the one thing he can do worldwide that he can't do otherwise because he's in such a small, small state. And it's not for, for revenue's sake, it's for influence's sake. I think that's fair. Um, there are two major capital investments that the Emir and the royal family of Qatar have made. One of them is the Al Jazeera television networks, which is now up to eight channels. And you probably won't be surprised to learn that the two biggest money makers are the sports channel and the children's channel. The news channel still does not uh, make a profit. But as you say, there's tremendous prestige and influence in the news channel. The other major investment is what's called Education City, which is meant to be the largest university in the Middle East. It has already recruited several major American universities to participate. And clearly, what the Emir Sheikh Al Thani is about is creating a kind of intellectual Switzerland uh, for Qatar to be. Uh, to be an intellectual you center, to be it an Cotter opinion. Cotter or Cotter? Um, you know, All right. some you, people. I'll say Qatar, you say Qatar. Yeah. Okay. Um, Excuse me. But he clearly wants to create a state that is a bastion of free inquiry and free but doesn't, speech. Doesn't he really have more ambition than that recently? Isn't that enough? No, I think he's, well, I'm just trying to find out. Sure, that's enough. Well, it's enough for you and me. But if you had all that natural gas, you know, uh, you might do what you've just said. But, you know, recently he invited uh, Shamir of uh, Israel uh, to go to Qatar to uh, speak with him and to be on Al Jazeera. And during that conversation, he, the Emir, put out a plan for a Mideast uh, peace settlement. Well, Qatar has been very active, even proactive, diplomatically, again, mostly for the last 10 years, since it gained this public voice through the Al Jazeera networks and the Al Jazeera Arabic News Service. It's gotten more and more involved in regional diplomacy, and consistently, um, it's 
uh, influence is for harmony uh, among the peoples of the Middle East, for peace between Israel and the Arab world, uh, for positive interaction uh, among the Jewish, Christian, Hindu, Muslim, and Buddhist worlds. And so this guy seems to be a thoroughgoing intellectual liberal who is putting money where his political sentiments lie. And those sentiments I would describe as Jeffersonian. This is a guy who, like Jefferson, is a radical in support of freedom of speech. And I would think that if Thomas Jefferson watched Al Jazeera Arabic and heard some of the hate speech that is regularly broadcast and some of the anti-Semitism that is regularly broadcast and heard it in the context in which it is always broadcast, which is to say as part of a discussion among people who are philo-Semites, uh, among people who are political liberals or conservatives or moderates. Um, and so the idea here is not the advocacy of one point of view, but the advocacy of the presentation and the interaction of all points of view. And <laughs> English, the English language television station is going to be similarly oriented, but the difference really? here is that in the Arabic speaking world, you could not exclude anti-Semitism or anti-Israeli statements and have anything close to a complete picture of the political social debate. In the global world, that kind of anti-Semitism is a much more marginal sentiment, well, would and you therefore run it, it would be much more marginally represented on our air. Will it be run at all? Where it's newsworthy, yes. Now, what, what would you do if you were running, uh, you are the anchor, whether you, suppose you were anchoring yeah. a program that had a debate as the one we saw in the front, where the, um, Arab, if I can call him that, because he doesn't have a name otherwise, uh, is saying that the United States should be destroyed and bombed. Would you, uh, if you were anchoring that, would you, would you say, stop, I'm not, it's not going to be part, it's not going to be on my watch? Uh, no, I would say, and why do you believe that? And why do you think that would be a positive action? And how do you think that would benefit your interests or the interests of your people? In other words, I would pursue them like us nasty journalists do, uh, by asking pointed and skeptical questions. I don't think that our viewers would need me to put a thumb on the scale and say, oh, reprehensible behavior. I think that from the ebb and flow of the debate, from the questions and the answers, they'd make their own judgment as to who's reprehensible. Uh, Ahmed Sheikh, who's the editor-in-chief of Al Jazeera Arabic, does that sound right to you? It does. Uh, this is an interview with him. Do you mean to say that if Israel did not exist, there would suddenly be democracy in Egypt? That the schools in Morocco would be better? That the public clinics in Jordan would function better? Answer, I think so. Would you run that type of uh, information? He's sure. saying basically if, if uh, Israel is destroyed, we'll, uh, we'll all be better off. And he's the guy who's the head of Al Jazeera. Um, a head. You know, a, a, and, and you know I, having not seen the context, but my yeah. journalist, it, it, my journalist's instinct is sure, let him say it. Does it sound sensible? No, not really. Uh, and and I think that the majority of viewers would be able to say, well, the really interesting part of this discussion is the open criticism of all of these Arab states, and not just open, but particular and focused. And the excuse that the existence of Israel is what accounts for all of these very serious quotidian flaws in the Arab states would seem patently ridiculous. How much, how much, uh, I showed the part of Al Jazeera that I did, uh, essentially to show what terrific quality it was. Uh, so if I now ask, um, you know, if it gets out of control, what do you do? The uh, question before I get to that is really, how much control do you have as an anchor person before you, that stuff runs? Do you know exactly what's going to run, and can you say no, can you say yes, or are you pretty much, well, how does it work? You know, in, in, in 48 years now in broadcasting, <laughs> I've learned that I actually control only one thing. What you said. That, exactly, <laughs> what comes out of my mouth. Uh, and for that, I'm always willing to be held responsible, and because of that, um, I will say to an editor, I'm not going to say it that way or I'm not going to say oh, that. Yeah. Um, but what follows, you can't control. But what follows, you know, I am, I am not the editor, nor do I aspire to be the editor uh, of news at Al Jazeera. Um, 
I am what they call a presenter. I do um, write much of my copy and edit all of it. I do take responsibility for everything that I say, but I have no aspirations to control what other people say. Okay. And again, I think the give and take of that is the real product. Let's go back uh, and think about what we saw uh, in that show that we showed where you were anchoring a mm -hmm. broadcast that concentrates on Israel's president's problems. Let me ask, do you think that that particular presentation was over tilted toward Israel? In other words, did it emphasize Israel uh, too much? It, that was uh, what Brock has called a lead. Let me tell you what uh, I saw the same night on BBC and PBS. I didn't see that. I saw just a snippet. The big story, which is more or less the same time frame as yours because of time difference, the big story uh, that day was bombing uh, in Iraq and the Lebanon situation. Those were the two leads. And if you watched the year broadcast all the way through, you got to that, but it wasn't up front. Uh, what do you think? Um, I think if I had had a vote, the Katzow story would have run third or fourth. But, um, <laughs> and that's only because the presidency in Israel is a largely ceremonial role. Right. And Katzow's presence or absence has almost no effect on policy. Um, what I think is telling about this, and I think it's as true for us as it is uh, for Al Jazeera Arabic, is that uh, the Middle East is home territory and that therefore uh, we do cover it intensively. Um, Israel is one of the superpowers of the Middle East and therefore anything that happens there is news um, and that uh, it is covered without fear or favor. I mean that was a right down the middle uh, report start to finish. Uh, it took no glee in Israel's discomfiture uh, at all of these scandals. It simply reported them. Uh, it made no attempt to minimize the scandals. It just well, Let me argue them. a little bit whether that was down, was down the middle. Um, what happened in that uh, broadcast, first we had the president and we said what his problem was. Right. In order to uh, elaborate further and put the story in context, it talked about uh, past Israel. presidents talked about uh, and the Asia past Weitzman and the fact that he left under a cloud. And then it also talked about the uh, Omer, who was also under So what you had basically was challenge. you had a, a story of, uh, of of three people under a under a cloud at, at great length. Now I don't think myself looking at that it necessarily yells out at me uh, we're anti-Israel, but I've watched the uh, watched the show for a couple of weeks now. And it seems to me that Israel always has a prominent place at the top of the news and that the stories are taken out quite a bit. So you get a huge impression about Israel that uh, may or may not imply a tilt. What's you, what do you think? Well, unfortunately, Israeli politics for the last 10 years have been rife with ethical problems. Uh, Olmert is under several kinds of criminal and ethical investigation. His predecessor, Ariel Sharon, narrowly escaped indictment, and his own son was indicted and convicted for essentially uh, laundering money uh, that had been illegally contributed to Sharon's campaign. Um, these are very serious issues in a democracy like Israel, and they merit coverage. And again, I think the coverage has been factual and down the middle, and there has been no glee expressed, certainly on Al Jazeera English, as I say, about the discomfiture or the moral challenges to the Israeli government, but they're there. They're news. Well, now let's ask ourselves what the real agenda is of, of Al, Al Jazeera. And let's just assume for a moment that we have one service which you say yourself probably would provide more anti-Semitic coverage uh, than the other. Uh, the other, which is the one you are on, seems to me very well, much I, like... I would say not anti-Semitic coverage, but covers anti-Semitism. All right, that's fine. Show, I mean, I'm there just is trying a to difference. Say, the, the two services are different. Yes, very much yeah. so. And so what is going through the mind of uh, the Amir? where on the one hand he has this very different service that uh, may deserve some of the pejorative comments made about it or may not, but it's certainly entirely different than BBC. I, I don't understand how the same person can do two things 
it seems to me slightly different directions. I mean, what, what gives with this guy? I think he's, he's your boss, I, so I, think he's, I think he's a plu perfect Jeffersonian. And also, uh, to me, personally, he's reminiscent of William Paley. Because when I, I'm such a codger, you and me, we're, we're, we're definitely in the, in the uh, codger department. <laughs> um, that when I started at CBS, it was Bill Paley's company, and that made a tremendous difference because this entrepreneur literally believed that everything with the CBS brand name on it was a personal reflection on him, which made him call newsrooms at all hours of the day to complain about this coverage or that mispronunciation to monitor it because he wanted the product to be good at a pride. And I think that this is also true of Sheikh Alpani, uh, the Emir of Qatar. I think he wants to be the Bill Paley or the Medici of media, if you will, of the 21st century. And I think he has very high standards for freedom of speech and freedom of expression and a very high confidence that in a fair fight, the virtuous side, uh, the um, open side of the debate will always conquer. And my feeling is, and I, I, he's putting his money there, is that the only way to defeat bad arguments is with better arguments. And I think that's what Al Jazeera Arabic is devoted to, and I think that's what Al Jazeera English is devoted to, airing a lot of specious and some vicious arguments, but putting them in a context in which better counter arguments can swamp them. You don't think, uh, here's a cynic, cynic's view of this, that putting out a service that very much looks like BBC, and indeed is at a very high quality, higher than CNN. I would say higher than BBC World today. And, I, and you said higher, it's a very high quality service, that there isn't some cynicism, let's say if not part of the, of the um, uh, shake of, of Gutter, but the shake who directs the editorial coverage of the whole service, to take the viewer in and then when you spend all that time talking about, talking about Israel, sort of implicitly tilt the person perhaps against Israel? Do you understand what I'm saying as a, if, as if a that subtle, happened, it subtle would be propagandistic? Uh, uh, well, but I, I think if you look at our word, coverage of Israel, and you know, I, I certainly look at uh, hours a day um, of Al Jazeera English's journalism in Israel, I think you will understand why Al Jazeera has been thrown out of 18 Arab states but never out of Israel. Uh, Al Jazeera is well respected and, by the way, very closely watched in Israel. No problem getting on the cable or satellite in Israel. We've come uh, to uh, we're there, and we're watched, and we're respected, because Al Jazeera in Arabic was the first, and still is just about the only Arabic-speaking channel, that regularly features Israeli voices. And I should say, not just the friendly Peace Now voices, and not just the people we love to hate, the, the really hating wing of the far right of the Likud party, but the full spectrum of Israeli voices. We've run out of time. Dave Marish. Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> when are we going to? Boy, will I take that as when, when are we going to see more of this on uh, U.S. television? One word answer. Soon. Soon. Thanks a lot for coming by, Dave. Thanks, Jim. And thank you for coming by. And come by next week and learn more about the digital age. For the digital age, I'm James Goodale. Good night.